Hey, it's Noah, and you're listening to Professional Development, the New York City Teacher Podcast. In today's episode, we are picking up where we left off in our mini series on the history of the UFT. In episode 10, we explored the 1970s, a decade that saw New York City left largely on its own to balance a massive budget and regain credit after many years of financial mismanagement. Teachers went on strike in 1975 after 14,000 teachers were laid off by the mayor in a misguided attempt to save some money. Teachers then saved the day by extending what was essentially a loan to the city from the teacher retirement system. The year 1980 saw the highest rate of inflation since 1947. Mayor Koch anticipated a half a billion dollar budget deficit that year, so he targeted 13,000 city jobs through accelerated attrition and layoffs, along with a $150 billion budget cut from the Board of Education's $3.3 billion budget. So we're starting off the decade with more of the same, basically. Koch had ordered Chancellor Frank Macchiarola to close 14 schools in 1979 and ordered him to close another 40 in 1980. Macchiarola closed another 14. The board president, Stephen Aiello, suggested Koch's plan would result in 4,000 teachers and several thousand additional staffers laid off, which would result in larger class sizes. Koch fired back that the city wasn't getting its money's worth out of schools and cops had to come first. The five years leading up to 1980 had seen 42% inflation. The budget for schools had increased just 2.6% in comparison to an overall city budget hike of 14.5%. So while budgets were technically increasing, the school's budget was increasing the least, and none of these increases were keeping up with inflation. So in terms of real value, the schools had actually lost about a billion dollars in funding in a five-year period. The Financial Control Board was still essentially in control of the purse strings at this point. So union leaders went to them when it was time to negotiate a new contract in May of 1980. With annualized inflation at 18%, the union was rightfully looking for raises that would keep up. But the board was initially unwilling to go above 4%. A month later, though, the UFT joined a 25-union, non-uniformed coalition and managed to get an 8% raise in each of two years, as well as increases in welfare fund payments with no givebacks. All of this was equivalent to about a 19.5% increase in uh, the value of the contract. In 1980, we have the inauguration of Ronald Reagan as president. His record on education was already established before he entered the White House as he served two terms as governor of California. Education, ironically, was part of what got him elected governor in a roundabout way as he successfully rode the wave of conservative ire at the protests on campus at the University of California, Berkeley. He demanded a legislative investigation of alleged communism and sexual misconduct at the University of California at Berkeley. But when we talk about sexual misconduct in this case, we're not talking about real sexual misconduct. We're we're basically talking about the kids having too much fun. Same with the communism. Uh, He insisted on public hearings, claimed a small minority of hippies Radicals and filthy speech advocates had caused disorder and that they should be taken by the scruff of the neck and thrown off campus permanently. That's a a direct quote. Once elected, he called for an end to free tuition for state college and university students, 20% across the board cuts in higher education funding annually. He repeatedly slashed construction funds for state campuses engineered the firing of Clark Kerr, the highly respected president of the University of California, and declared that the state should not subsidize intellectual curiosity. Another direct quote. 
Here he is in a brief clip from the History Channel about an event in Berkeley in 1969. At Berkeley, there was a plot of land that had been taken by protesters. The university owned it. They were trying to turn it into a parking lot. The protesters uh, claimed it as a park, a park for the people. Reagan orders the California Highway Patrol and Berkeley police officers to the park. While the crowd continues to swell, Reagan's chief of staff sends reinforcements to the scene. He tells them to use whatever methods they choose against the protesters. Not long after, police start firing buckshot and tear gas. One student is killed, and an estimated 128 people are admitted to local hospitals. Reagan declares a state of emergency and sends in the National Guard. He was attempting to crack down on student protesters. You know, depending on your political point of view, uh, he was either successful in doing so or he was uh, authoritarian. Those people told you for days in advance that if the university sought to go ahead with that construction, they were going to physically destroy the university. Well, now, why Reagan did you to negotiate many times? Negotiate? What is Governor to negotiate? Reagan, what is? What the university just... is a public institution. That's it's right. Institution but the university, the... The, its own community, and for the community of Berkeley that live around it. All of it began the first time some of you who know better and are old enough to know better let young people think that they had the right to choose the laws they would obey as long as they were doing it in the name of social protest. When it came to restoring order on unruly campuses, Reagan said, and I quote, if it takes a bloodbath, let's get it over with. No more appeasement. Not long after the statement, four Kent State students were shot to death during the May 4th, 1970 protest rally. In the aftermath of what became known as the Kent State Massacre, Reagan declared his remark was only a figure of speech. He said that anyone who was upset by it was neurotic. I would call that a textbook example of gaslighting. So that's Reagan's approach to public higher education. But what about the primary and secondary education, which is more in line with the scope of the show? As governor of California, he consistently prevented any increases in state-level funding for public schools. Somebody had to pay for them. So this lack of funding trickled down to the local level. See what I did there? Resulting in increases in local taxes, picking up the slack left by the state. Eventually, taxpayers at the local level fought back and refused additional local tax increases, which left schools severely underfunded. We're talking overcrowded classrooms, crumpling buildings, worn out books, and completely demoralized teachers. Half of the teachers at the L.A. Unified School District walked out for five weeks in 1970 to protest their conditions. The strike was not particularly successful, though, and Reagan was predictably unsympathetic to the striking teachers. Reagan left California public schools far worse than he found them through his model of cutting funding to social goods, that has become the primary tenet of conservative politics in the U.S. The whole idea is to eat at the table, but ignore the bill, hoping someone else will pick it up at a different level of government. Then, eventually, nobody picks up the tab, and you insist it is a failure of big government and insist on a private option, a service your funders are more than equipped to handle, although a comparison between the properly funded public service and an overpriced, undeveloped private service will favor the government service every time. So why would anybody support this approach to public services? Reagan's voter base in California was largely the conservative older generation that had finished up their schooling and whose kids had finished up school, or maybe were no longer writing home from Berkeley. That's also possible. In other words, while much of the state is at the table eyeing the bill, There are enough people who aren't hungry and can't imagine a future in which they are hungry uh, to elect the guy who is promising them that they won't have to pay their fair share for dinner. 
a public good that no longer concerns them. But why look into Reagan's Californian years of infamy to begin with? Well, his governorship proved a perfect model for what he would do in education at the federal level and how the effects would impact public schools in the city. When Reagan took office, the federal share of education spending was roughly 12%. When he left office eight years later, it had been reduced by half to 6%. Right out of the gate, Reagan moved to reduce Title I funds for impoverished children. He proposed a total $124 million cut to New York City schools, including school lunches. Reagan is the one, after all, who suggested that ketchup is a vegetable. He would fold categorical federal funds into block grants to states, but there were no guarantees that states would spend the money that previous law had allocated for specific purposes. This was also the beginning of the end for strong unions in the U.S. Reagan got the ball rolling by firing 11,345 striking members of the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization and banning them from federal service for life. This broke the union and made the U.S. a significantly less safe place to fly. The parallel with current events is striking if you'll forgive the pun, as the 10,000 strong UAW members employed by John Deere are currently striking over a ridiculous contract with a vicious tier system that would divide employees into those hired before a certain date who earn a living wage with a pension and those hired after that date who earn no pension and hardly a living wage. Anyway, John Deere has salaried employees crossing the picket line to operate heavy machinery in the factories, and the 911 calls coming out of these factories would be comical if they weren't real. Anybody following tabloid news will have heard about Alec Baldwin accidentally killing his director of photography and injuring his director while firing a gun on set that was meant to be loaded with blanks. As it turns out, the armorer who handed him the weapon is a scab who crossed the IATSE picket line, along with a bunch of film students and otherwise ununionized, undertrained staff to make the movie, on which Alec Baldwin also happens to be an executive producer, and thus has a good deal of say in these sorts of decisions. All of this is to say, of course, that trained workers are required to maintain safe conditions. So the obsession with union busting in this country has, on several occasions, caused people to come to physical harm or to die needlessly, all in the name of concentrating corporate wealth at the cost of workers' income and benefits. Speaking of safety, Chancellor Machiarola required virtually automatic suspension of students found with weapons beginning in May of 1981. By March of the 1980 to 1981 school year, School authorities had confiscated 50 handguns, two rifles, 181 knives, and 37 other weapons from students. Schenker was pleased with the new policy, but this is one of the situations in which a little perspective goes a long way. This is a little editorial note for you. Speaking as interested teacher Noah and not quasi-impartial podcaster Noah, having sat through a good many chapter meetings, I have never heard a complaint against students that didn't make me cringe a little. Unionized teacher versus student conflict looks and sounds really bad for us as teachers, and it's because it belies a lack of perspective. When a student brings a weapon to school, it's not because they want to harm their teacher or their principal or their custodian or even their classmate most of the time. Usually, it's because they are scared. Probably they're not even afraid of of what's going to happen in school. Rather, they're afraid of the trip to school and the trip back home. So if this is the case, and I don't have the data to prove it, but anecdotally it rings true with my limited experience in talking to students, including students who have been caught with weapons, how is a suspension going to help address the circumstances that would lead a student to feel the need to carry a weapon? Teaching in schools of poverty will always be a losing battle 
unless we recognize the circumstances that surround the school. As teachers, we're never going to feel like we are moving the needle in the slightest if we fail to take account of the forces actively oppressing our students. In fact, if we're not careful, by ignoring these forces, we might actually allow them to act through us. Anyway, by August of 1982, the UFT reported that crime against members had fallen 22%, thanks to the tougher security and discipline, including summoning police and immediately suspending students caught with weapons. For more on this topic, be sure to check back in for the Police in Schools episode coming up sometime in the next few weeks. The UFT backed Lieutenant Governor Mario Cuomo, father of our recently disgraced Andrew Cuomo, for governor in the 1982 gubernatorial election. He defeated Mayor Koch in the primary and went on to win the election. It is unclear how much influence the UFT really had on this election, but Al Shanker is on the record as saying of the UFT endorsement, Mario told us, this was the single most important event in the campaign. Compare that to the UFT's absurd endorsements in the most recent mayoral election, in which the UFT backed Scott Stringer, who came in fifth in the first round of voting in the Democratic primary, capturing just 5.5% of the first choice vote. And then Eric Adams, the obvious last choice for anybody whose city employee salary will be up for negotiation during his prospective tenure. Whatever clout we might have had in 1982 has clearly dissipated. By December of 1982, the city's budget threatened teachers once again, with Koch suggesting about 6,600 jobs would have to be cut through attrition by 1984 with half of these coming from schools. School employees made up about a third of city jobs at the time, so this was disproportionate. Fortunately for all parties concerned, the summer of 1983 marked the end of the early 80s recession. No jobs would have to be cut, and enrollment in public schools began to rise again, with full-day kindergarten replacing half-day kindergarten, marking a trend towards earlier intervention as a tool for decreasing high school dropout rates in the city. William Bennett, the Secretary of Education under Reagan, spent years touring the U.S. and attacking important aspects of public education, including teacher certification and teachers' unions as well as the likely less important, quote, multi-layered, self-perpetuating bureaucracy of administrators that weighs down most school systems. He lumped these elements together and called them the blob. His unfounded criticism of schools self-perpetuates to this day, with charter advocates dipping into the same bucket of inflammatory language to justify the infusion of private interests into this most important public good. Criticism of public education reached a crescendo in 1983 when Reagan handpicked a blue ribbon commission that wrote a denunciation of public education entitled A Nation at Risk. The document charged that the United States risked losing its competitive economic status among the nations of the world due to a, quote, rising tide of educational mediocrity that threatens our very future as a nation and a people. Of course, the commissioners did not consider the possibility that U.S. firms were uncompetitive because of the corporate mismanagement, greed, and short-sightedness that are the hallmarks of the post-war United States corporate system. Nor did they consider that mediocre performance in school, however that is measured, might be the consequence of the poverty that results when wealth is concentrated at the upper rungs of the economic ladder, leaving less in the way of resources for those further down the ladder. Surprisingly, and unfortunately, Al Shanker responded to a nation at risk by suggesting a summit of business, military, and education leaders to discuss what might be done about the credible threat posed by the mediocrity of the schools. 
He urged teachers unions to embrace the report and push for higher standards. Implicitly, he was suggesting teachers embrace the lack of perspective I mentioned earlier, ignore poverty, ignore the actual dollar amount it would require schools to accomplish the tasks required of them, and instead push teachers to work harder to address all of society's woes within the narrow confines of school buildings. Confines that grow narrower and narrower, mind you, as society depends more and more on the resources provided in this last holdout of social welfare. Remember that de Blasio insisted on keeping schools open as long as he did in March of 2020, not for the educational value added by public schools, but for the childcare and free lunches distributed as part of the school day. While Schenker might have intended to increase the leverage of unionized teachers by pointing to their value in an economically competitive nation, the result was to play into the rhetoric of big business and conservative politicians that led to the charter school movement, which is no friend to unionized teachers, nor is it affirming of education as a public resource. In the 84 to 85 school year, there was a massive teacher shortage with 3,500 vacancies that the Board of Ed filled with 3,200 temporary per diem or TPD teachers who were not credentialed and had no job security. TPDs took a summertime intensive in classroom essentials plus six college credits in each of their first four years as they worked toward state certification. That should sound somewhat familiar to listeners who heard our episodes on TFA and teaching fellows, as this was essentially a precursor to alternative pathways into the classroom. TPDs worked full time, but had no job security as the Board of Ed had to replace them as soon as a regularly appointed teacher off a Board of Examiners rank order list showed up with the appropriate credential. As is always the case with a teacher shortage, the vacancies are only the tip of the iceberg, as 5,000 additional teachers taught out of their license area in the 84 to 85 school year. There were 4,200 vacancies by the start of the 85 to 86 school year. In terms of salary, City schools ranked 109th out of 111 in area districts, and Tier 1 and Tier 2 teachers were lining up to retire at the age of 55. The Board of Ed was scrambling to recruit teachers from Spain and Puerto Rico. First-year attrition soared, and it looked like the Board would have to hire an additional 1,500 teachers to fill new vacancies before the school year even ended. The city had stalled on the new contract negotiation, leaving no choice for either party but to proceed into last offer binding arbitration. The final arbitration agreement came out mid-September. It increased starting salary by 38% and salaries overall jumped by nearly 20%. In 1986, Al Shanker retired as UFT president so he could focus on his leadership of the AFT. Sandra Feldman, who had served as secretary and executive director of the UFT, stepped up to take on the role of president. From early on, her program was meant to consist of real educational decision-making, better safety and maintenance, sufficient textbooks and supplies, less paperwork, teacher-developed and run training, mentoring for new teachers, tougher discipline for students, and lower class size. She claimed the UFT was a children's lobby. Early in her career, Feldman scored a victory that changed state law so a teacher could not lose a pension by contesting dismissal, as the administrative code of the city had previously required. This followed a UFT win in federal appeals court, which said the code put a price on a procedural due process right. The case involved a teacher who resigned to protect her pension 
while successfully defending a misconduct charge lodged at her by a harassing principal. Feldman also brought Mayor Koch into the schools to show him the results of having put off building maintenance during the fiscal crisis. There was asbestos in the air and gaping holes in ceilings, floors, and walls. Mayor Koch was moved and produced a down payment of $16 million to fix up schools, and the Board of Education announced a $4.5 billion capital plan with $758 million going to the maintenance backlog. Teachers' Choice grew out of the realization in the late 1980s that teachers were paying out of pocket to outfit their classrooms with needed supplies. The UFT negotiated with the city council to secure Teachers' Choice allotments for every teacher. The Teachers' Choice payments are renegotiated every year, which is how we did not receive the $250 Teachers' Choice payment in the 2020 to 2021 school year, but we will this school year. COPE also took shape during the late 80s. COPE is a political action committee overseen by the UFT and funded with payroll deductions that teachers elect to contribute. The political action carried out by COPE was responsible for guaranteeing pensions for those who have earned them. Uh, it's huge because it, it protects workers from legislation like the Condon Wadlin Act that could be used to strip striking workers of their pensions and thus discourage them from job actions. In 1987, the UFT secured a three-year contract ending with a $25,000 to $50,000 uh, salary range made possible by Mario Cuomo's Excellence in Teaching Funds. There were similar raises for functional chapters, and in a first, paraprofessionals gained a longevity raise. Teachers in non-Title I elementary schools got one prep period per day instead of two per week. There were better transfer, accessing, and class coverage rules, less cafeteria duty for secondary teachers, and an expedited disciplinary procedure for pedagogues. Contractual provisions advanced teacher professionalism as well, which Board President Wagner said placed the city at the head of the educational reform movement. They allowed a school-based option, or SBO, so a school staff administration could improve education by modifying contractual and board rules governing class size, rotation of assignments or classes, teacher schedules, and rotation of paid coverages. They also created professional conciliation so teachers could challenge administrators' educational decisions in matters like grading policy, textbook selection, and program scheduling. They also improved new teacher training, which would occur during the school day with peer mentors, among other changes. Finally, they launched the Confidential and Voluntary Peer Intervention Program, or PIP, in which teacher interveners could help struggling tenured colleagues. If classroom performance didn't improve, PIP counseled teachers to leave teaching. Uh, disciplinary action was stayed during the intervention, and interveners could not be called as witnesses if the principal pursued dismissal. In the last few years of the decade, Feldman and the UFT came out hard in support of metal detectors in schools. Again, we will spend some time on quote-unquote discipline as well as police in schools in a forthcoming episode. But for now, let it be known that when contract negotiations got a little easier on the union, it went straight to the metal detectors as its new project. And so, as we reach the end of the 1980s, it is time to transition to this week's news update. I'll start by reading an October 25th article by Alex Zimmerman in Chalkbeat entitled NYC adding metal detectors and police after guns found in schools. A little bit of history repeating itself. The article reads as follows. After a spat of incidents involving students bringing guns into school buildings, 
New York City will deploy additional metal detectors to campuses and send extra police personnel during arrival and dismissal, Mayor Bill de Blasio said Monday. The city has identified 30 campuses that will immediately see metal detectors on an unannounced rotating basis. There are currently 79 campuses that have permanent metal detectors, as well as seven roving metal detectors in operation, police officials said. We know there's some schools where there's been some real issues lately, de Blasio said. We need to make sure we're adding extra protection to make sure there's never violence, never any incident where a child is harmed. The mayor's decision to deploy more law enforcement resources to schools comes as the number of guns found in school buildings has ticked up this school year compared with the two years before the pandemic, leading some parents and advocates to pressure the mayor to take action. But the move also met resistance from critics who argue sending more police and metal detectors will criminalize students of color and won't resolve the underlying reasons students may get into fights or bring guns to school. In a two-day stretch last week, school safety agents recovered five guns from students. Two of these guns were identified by metal detectors, NYPD officials said. In all, eight guns have been recovered from students this school year through October 24th, up from one during the same time during the 2019 to 2020 school year, and two the year before that, according to police data. The recent spat of guns found in schools follow other incidents around the country, including in Newark, where a loaded gun was brought into school, and in Philadelphia, where a student shot himself in the leg inside a school building. The school building in Philadelphia used metal detectors. It was not clear how the gun got inside. In addition to the extra metal detectors, de Blasio indicated that the city would send extra police personnel to school buildings at the beginning and end of the day and would create 20 safe corridors in which police are stationed between schools and transit hubs. Police officials acknowledged the city may have to tap into local precincts to come up with enough staff. There are currently 3,200 school safety agents, NYPD Chief of Department Rodney Harrison told reporters, down from a high of about 5,000 in prior years. About 8% of the safety agents have not been vaccinated and are thus ineligible to work due to the city's vaccination mandate for all school staff. Officials are preparing for an incoming class of 250 agents at the end of November, Harrison said, a smaller number than initially planned. It is difficult to know how useful the additional metal detectors are likely to be. The police department has declined to provide detailed data about which schools have metal detectors and which items were confiscated as a result, despite a city law requiring disclosure of that information. We have so little insight into the effectiveness of metal detectors or unannounced scanning, said Johanna Miller, director of the New York Civil Liberties Union's Education Policy Center. Her organization is suing the police department for information about how the metal detectors are used. What are metal detectors being paired with as a long-term solution? A 2016 investigation by ProPublica and WNYC found that Black and Hispanic high school students were three times as likely to be required to walk through a metal detector compared to white students, and the amount of contraband picked up by them is relatively low. Some students have argued forcefully that the scanning makes them feel overly policed, that their schools are more dangerous and can lead to other disruptions such as long lines that force students to miss class. With some of those concerns in mind, de Blasio said the additional scanning would be conducted in a way that is respectful and communicative. City officials have touted other efforts to address students' emotional needs, especially given the effects of the pandemic on students' mental health. The city is rolling out a screening tool to gauge students' emotional health and promised to give every school access to a social worker or school-based mental health clinic. Nearly all of the 500 social workers the city promised to hire are in place, said Education Department spokesperson Nathaniel Steyer. Though he did not immediately say how many schools are without access to a social worker or mental health clinic.
And now, a report from Virginia about a Richmond area school district implementing mental health days into the school calendar. And Queen County Schools announcing this week it would be adding wellness days to the school year, effectively just days off for students and staff. This comes after Richmond Schools announced two mental health days next month, resulting in schools being closed for the first week of November. On your side at six, Karina Bolster is hearing from a mental health advocate about this effort. Well, the mental health counselor I spoke with tells me she has clients who are educators, but today Dr. Lakeisha Roney had an experience that hit close to home. I got an emergency call from my son's school saying that he had a meltdown. It was a call the longtime therapist did not expect to receive right before our interview on the mental health effects of the pandemic in the school system. But Dr. Lakeisha Roney felt it was important to share in this context. I know that he's had a difficult time adjusting to this new year this new school year. The mom of the first grader says her son's teachers and counselors handled the situation well, but she knows there's been struggle on their end this year as well. Within my practice, um, there are a few clients that work in the education system, and that's the feedback that I've been receiving is that they're overwhelmed. It's why she supports the decision, albeit short notice, about Richmond schools adding two mental health days in the first week of November. This week, the King and Queen County School Board also voted to add wellness days into the school year. As a school system, what can you do? What are some things that you can put in place, whether it's Uh, building in a couple extra days here and there or um, putting in some wellness programs for your staff members to retain them. Earlier this month, the Chesterfield County School Board voted unanimously to make today a student holiday and a full teacher work day. Hanover schools allowed employees to work remotely on October 11th to help with their planning time. Both Henrico and Hanover schools are looking at all options for ways to reduce stress and promote mental health in the school system for students and staff. All of us need community and connection during this time. Everyone's stressed out and we all need support and sometimes we need a break as well. On your side, Karina Bolster, NBC 12 News. And with that, we wrap up episode 14 of Professional Development, the New York City Teacher Podcast. Thanks so much for spending this time with us. If you are enjoying the show, be sure to subscribe wherever you do your podcast listening and consider leaving a five-star review. I have no idea what effect that has on the algorithm, if any, but it sure is a thrill to see a positive rating. Consider also checking out patreon.com slash professional development if you haven't already, where for a mere $3 monthly consulting fee, you'll get an extra two episodes per month and whatever goodies we can come up with to send you as bonuses. To the nine subscribers who are on board so far as of this recording, thank you so much. Your mugs are on the way if they haven't reached you yet. To the prospective 10th subscriber out there who hasn't pulled the trigger yet but is thinking about it, hurry up before someone else beats you to it and you will get a free professional development podcast mug. Thanks again and see you back here or at patreon.com slash professional development same time next week.